Hi guys, welcome to our very first episode. In fact, it's our pilot episode <laughs> of Kling Spores Tech Talk. We're glad you've decided to join us today. And uh, I'm Nick DeMars. I'm Luke Dombrowski. And today, what do we do here? Well, what we're going to do is we're gonna look at coated abrasives, uh, better known out in the industry as sandpaper. Now, you might ask a question that I've been asked many times. What in the world is so technical about sandpaper? I've been asked this question many times. I've been asked, what, what do you do for a living? I work in Kling Spore's technical department. Well, what in the world can be so technical about sandpaper? So that's the question, Luke. What can be so technical about sandpaper? We can get very technical about sandpaper. Or we, could, we try to keep things as easy as possible, as simple as possible, but with technical, what we do here is uh, we guide you through the wilderness. The world of abrasives, coated or bonded alike, can get very confusing. Uh, there's so many different combinations, so many different things to get a job done. And we are the tour guides on that travel. We try to put people in the right direction by uh, describing what, what would work best for them, uh, how to get a best finish, uh, things you're looking to do. Um, what we also try to do is narrow down your, op your, your coated abrasives to what you could use um, to try to distinguish them amongst each other. To do this, we separate them by the different types of grains they have, the different types of backings they have, and the different types of bondings that actually hold the grains together. Now, to go over uh, the four main types of grains that we work with, here, especially here at Klingspor, are um, silicone carbide, zirconia, a ceramic and aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide being the most common out mm -hmm. there. A silicon carbide has a very distinct types of grain that uh, works well in mostly glass and certain industries. Each, each grain itself has a special, special product for it um, that and a, a certain application that it best suits for, which we will definitely get into a lot of effort of that throughout the weeks. But uh, the different types of backings, uh, our coated abrasives comes with paper backings, they come with cloth backings, some poly backings, uh, fiber backings, oh, yeah. and some uh, latex and even film back backings. Uh, each one of those have their inherent properties that are good for certain applications and better for others. Uh, the different types of bondings, mostly glue and resin, mostly mm -hmm. resin, mm -hmm. little glue that's out there. But again, we can take all those different types of things and then there's some additives that we put on our coated abrasives for special applications, for special things to help loading, to help glazing, our, glazing over and things like that in the metal industry. Again, we're gonna get into a lot of that, but that's what we do at Technical. We take all that information, put it through and try to get you the best finish and the best product for what you're trying to do. Absolutely. And before we go too much deeper into this, we're gonna look at the uh, history of the company. Uh, hopefully you've heard of Klingspore Abrasives before, but if mm -hmm. you haven't, what we wanna do is we wanna take you to our website. It would be buy.klingspore.com. And we're going to uh, look at our company, point to the history and click on that. And that will take you to the history of the company. And as you'll see on this web page here, beginning in 1893, uh, Klingspore abrasives began as a glue factory. Uh, at that particular point in time, they didn't have so much intention of, of getting into the coated abrasives industry, but that was an up and, com up and coming industry. And so by 1899, we see where the first batch of coated abrasives was produced in a Klingspore factory. In 1926, Klingspore became Europe's first manufacturer of waterproof abrasive papers. And in 1944, we saw the development of high-speed cutting wheels and grinding discs. In 1954 was the introduction of abrasive flap wheels. And then in, in 1955, Klingspore up and moved the headquarters to Heiger, Germany, uh, where it's located at today. In 1971, we saw the introduction of the abrasive mop disc, or better known as the flap disc. Then we moved to 1979, where Christoph Klingspor came from Germany, opened up Klingspor USA in Hickory, North Carolina, with less than 20 people. In 1985, Klingspor USA moved into a newly constructed 60,000 square foot building on Tate Boulevard in Hickory, North Carolina. In 1986, we saw the introduction of long-term grinding belts. 1988 and 89, the North Carolina facility expanded by an additional 60,000 square feet. 
1996, we saw the first production of Klingspor grinding wheels in Poland. In 2003, we saw a logistics center put into operation. We saw a new patent pending quick change system for mop disks. And we also saw the development of high speed abrasive mops. In 2004, Klingspor USA, we celebrated our 25th year in operation. In 2018, the Klingspor Corporation celebrated its 125th year. And in 2019, Klingspor USA celebrated 40 years in the abrasive industry with a presence in most of the United States and in Mexico. So that's who we are and that's what we do. So what, the main focus of this program is to help you with solutions as far as your sanding and grinding is concerned. And in doing so, what we want you to do is we want you to send in some questions to us. Uh, you can email your questions to techtalk at klingspore.com. Let me spell that for you. T-E-C-H-T-A-L-K, no space, at klingspore.com. Email your questions in. If we don't get to them during the live program this week, we'll pick it up in one of the, the following weeks and, and address your question directly so we can help you with your sanding process, with polishing, grinding, whatever the case may be. So the first question we have for today, and we have had some sent in ahead of time, is that what, is, what information is necessary to correctly describe the application? Well, let me, let me explain this first. Anytime you would call us and ask us uh, what's the best sandpaper, the best uh, grinding wheel, cutoff wheel, so on and so forth, for your application, or, or, or for what you're doing, we're going to ask you what is the application. What do we mean by that? Well, first off, we mean what material are you sanding or grinding? Very, very important because as Luke mentioned several times, the different characteristics of coated abrasives come into play depending upon which material you're sanding or grinding. Mm -hmm. We're also going to ask you what product form. What we mean by that is are you using a random orbit sander and need a disc? Are you using a, a, a belt sander, a portable belt sander and need a, a 4x21 or 3x21 belt? Uh, are you using a wide belt sander? Okay. We're going to need to know at what point you are in the process. Uh, are you finishing? Are you doing material removal? These questions will help us to, to determine just exactly which abrasive uh, is best for your particular application, whether it be aluminum oxide, silicon carbide, whatever the case may be. And we do have uh, uh, abrasives that will fit just about any application, mm -hmm. uh, from soft wood to glass even. So it's a very important uh, thing that we get the right amount of information from you so we can tell you exactly which abrasive is best for your application. What is our next question, Luke? We got a question in from uh, Lamisha. Lamisha's ass out there. She says, I know that some sanding belts are made from cloth and some are made from paper. When would you use a cloth belt over a paper belt? Now, when we're talking about different types of backings like that, uh, it's good to know, starting off, what the backings represent. A paperback belts or paper backings are rated on a scale from A through F, and they're kind of rated uh, on tear resistance. A being more likely to tear, F being less likely to tear. On cloth belts or polyester belts, they're graded from J through Z. J being, and they're, they're graded on a scale of flexibility. J being the most flexible, Z being the stiffest. Now that comes into, comes into play when you're trying to talk about how aggressive you're gonna be with a belt. Um, and when we talk about that, you gotta find out of all the questions that you ask about what your application is, one of the main questions that you gotta find out is where you are in the sanding process. The sanding process, when I talk about it, it has three main steps. A heavy stock removal, intermediate sanding, and finishing sanding. Heavy stock removal is normally found around grits 60 and below between uh, a P grade of, a P grit of 80 through 120 is where you're doing your intermediate. Um, a 150 and above and finer, that's when you're doing your finishing. Uh, cloth belts are great at intermediate sanding and heavy stock removal because that's where you're being the most aggressive with that belt. So you need that cloth, a very nice strong backing to support that aggression that you're doing. Finer, when we're 150 or above, you're not going to be as aggressive. P 
paperback belts will help do a, a great job of uh, holding up in those spots because of the lack of aggression that you're being. You're putting those finishing touches on. You're making your uh, product look really nice at that point. You're not doing a lot of heavy stock removal. But those are some instances when uh, cloth meets paper. Um, out there too, a lot of people believe that paperback belts give you a better finish. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that, that comes into play. But cloth backs, you can really be aggressive with them. Papers, leave a good finish, but you can't be too rough with them. So you mentioned that uh, paper, uh, uh, paper products are A through F in weight? Yes. So at what point do we use belts then? Belts are usually always used at F, at the heaviest weight, the, the most durable. If you try to make a belt out of like an A weight or something like that, that thing might break before you even get oh, yeah. it on the machine. Yeah. So here at Klingspore, all of our paperback products are made with F weighted products. Material. All right. So the next question we have, somebody sent in, I always thought that sandpaper was sandpaper. How could one sandpaper be different from another? And this goes back again to what we talked about, that what's so technical about coated abrasives. Uh, not all sandpapers are created equal. Uh, like Luke mentioned, we've got the cloth backings, we've got the paper backings, we've got the film backings. You take that into consideration. Then you also take into consideration we've got aluminum oxide, silicon carbide, alumina zirconia, and ceramic aluminum oxide. By the time you take on all these considerations in, you've got almost infinite possibilities of how you can mix and match these di different characteristics and come up with something that's just about exactly what you need for your application. So is sandpaper just sandpaper? No, because you've got paper backings. Again, you've got the cloth backings. So we've got actually sanding cloth, <laughs> I guess you could say. Uh, but sandpaper, all, not all sandpaper is created equal. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, sandpapers, uh, yeah, you can run down to your local hardware store and grab a sandpaper, but it might not be the best thing for your application. So that's why we get technical here. We get into the details of exactly what you're using. Uh, if it's a softwood, we want something that's open coated because that, uh, we know that that softwood has got some inherent natural oils and resins and that open coating is gonna prevent that loading that's gonna take place, okay? Uh, wherewith on the opposite, opposite side of the spectrum, we're talking about hardwood. Hardwood, you're gonna want the closed coating. The closed coating, closed coated abrasive is gonna do much better for you in that application. So that's how we look at it. Sandpaper is not all equal all the way across the board. And that is a perfect segue right there into our next one, talking about open coat and closed coat. Because Melissa out there, again, thank you, Melissa, for sending in those questions. Melissa is curious about what is the difference in an open coat and a closed coat material? To help answer this question, we actually have a video that we're going to go to uh, help uh, answer this question for us. a specific sandpaper ideal for certain application. The combination of raw materials such as grain, backing, and bond play a very important role when it comes to the properties of a belt, disc, or sheet and its capabilities. Along with the grain type, the density of abrasive grains or the coat is another important characteristic that has a significant impact on the life and finishing properties of your abrasive. When it comes to coated abrasives, the term coat refers to grain density. And as a standard throughout the coated abrasives industry, you will generally see three different coats, closed, open, and semi-open. In this video, we'll explain what each coat is and how it can affect not only the time, effort, and cost of each workpiece you turn out, but also your final finish. To be able to see the difference, we need to have a very close look at the product. And to do this, we will look at each one under a microscope. The term closed coat refers to an abrasive that has 100% grain coverage on the backing. Being that the abrasive grains are very even across the entire surface of the sandpaper, it produces an even scratch pattern. In the finishing process, this would be very beneficial as you try to achieve the most even finish possible. 
It's also interesting to note that although the closed coat produces the best finish, it is also the most aggressive and can remove the most material in a given period of time. As you can see, an open coated abrasive shows large spaces between the individual grits, as approximately 50% of the backing is covered with abrasive grains. Open coated abrasives should be your choice for sanding soft materials because this grit density prevents premature clogging or loading and increases the lifetime of your product. Be aware that eventually all coated abrasives will load to a certain extent, but in an open coated abrasive there's more space between the grains. This allows more time before total loading takes place for the loaded particles to flake off and be evacuated in the sanding process. The third coat we would like to talk about is known as the semi-open coat. This coat is considered a middle-of-the-road coat. We've seen that the closed coat has 100% grain coverage and the open coat has approximately 50% grain coverage. The semi-open coat has approximately 70% grain coverage. This makes it a very versatile coat that can cover most if not all aspects of the sanding process, from material removal to finishing. When you consider the types of abrasive grains, backings, and bonds, knowing the different characteristics of each type of sandpaper can help you make the right choice to achieve the best sanding result for your project. Contact your local Klingspore representative to order your open, closed, or semi-open coated abrasives today. It's a good video right there. If you take away from that video, again, a good part of uh, the difference between open coat and closed coat is always going to be uh, the material that you're using. A good example of that, hard or soft wood, soft wood with the open coat, hard wood with the closed coat, and then again, where we are in the sanding process. That closed coat does leave us a better finish. So sometimes if you want to finish, you want to lean towards that closed coat more than that open coat. But Absolutely, good information. So a question that we've been asked numerous times here in the technical department at Klingspore Abrasives is uh, about older sanding belts. Uh, for instance, uh, the one question we received, one gentleman had said that he had bought some old Klingspore sanding belts at the flea market. <laughs> and we've all faced this. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's asking why, when I put these belts on my sander, are the joints popping? Is the belt coming apart? Well, let me explain that first by saying a, a, an abrasive belt is nothing but a long skinny sheet with the two ends joined together that turns it into a belt, okay? And in the process of making that, we use a special kind of tape and we use a special kind of adhesive to match that tape onto that belt, bring that thing together and make it a belt joint. Uh, the adhesive that's uh, used in that process, and this is not just cling spore abrasives, this is industry wide, but the, abra the, the adhesive that's used in that process uh, is, is an aging material, I guess you could say. Uh, over time, uh, the heat and humidity uh, inherent in uh, wood shops or metal shops or whatever the case may be is going to start breaking that glue down. It's going to start making that glue ineffective at holding that joint together. So here at Klingspore Abrasives, we uh, guarantee our belts for one year. Yeah. Okay. Beyond that time, uh, that's you know that that glue all the whole time is breaking down. It's wearing, and those joints could pop. So if you bought some old belts at the flea market, for instance, uh, be very careful. Uh, you, before you buy those belts, you want, might want to grab them and pull on it a little bit and see if you, see how it holds together. But just be aware that that these materials do age. Now, as I say this, the abrasive itself is still in great shape, mm -hmm. but uh, that that joint is going to eventually come apart because the materials do age over time. We have another question in. Uh, how do you keep sandpaper from clogging or loading? And if it does clog or load, can you clean it? This is a great one. Hmm. Um, we have a, uh, I mentioned before, we have some additives that we put in our coated abrasives. One in the woodworking industry that we uh, add to our, our coated abrasives is called a sterate. A sterate helps fight loading. Loading occurs when you're using a when you're working on a soft or gummy material and it sticks to your, your abrasive. Basically, after it builds up and builds up, it's gonna cover up the pointy end of the grains and you're not gonna be able to cut into your work mm -hmm. anymore. So um, 
a big product that Klingspore offers to help fight or counteract loading is our PS and our FP77. Oh yeah. It's our what we refer to as green tech. We'll have to talk about that here in the upcoming episodes, but green tech is made to fight loading. And that's it. And again, um, what we spoke about earlier, open code and closed code. Absolutely. Open coated products tend to load less because there's more room in between the grain for that dust and debris to work itself out of your product, your coated abrasive. And that, that's, that's what we use, open code, closed code, our green tech products, and, and we have an additive called Sterate. If you do load up your materials and all, a good, uh, you take the air hose out of your air compressor, just give it a good clean, Sometimes that'll clear it out and, re and reveal all that grain again. Go back to using it. I've known people that go out there and use wide belts and they will soak them down. Take a pressure washer to them and mm -hmm. clean them out. You can do that, but we recommend the clean sport, especially in the tech department, to let that thing get completely dry before you try to use that again. Safety first here at clean sport, mm -hmm. always. But yes, you can clean them. All right, another question that we have, uh, one customer says, I sand with 80 and 220 grits, and I you get uh, swirl marks, and I get uh, dark and light spots in my finished product. What am I doing wrong? Well, here at Klingspore, we like to recommend that you never skip more than one grit in the sanding sequence. When I say that, let's say your sanding sequence begins at 80 grit, okay? You sand with 80 grit. You can skip 100, go to 120, okay? You sand thoroughly with 120 grit. You can skip 150 and you can go to 180. You're only skipping one grit at a time. The reason we say to do that is because if you imagine in your mind the scratch pattern that's left behind from a coated abrasive, it's creating two things. It's creating what we call peaks and what we call valleys, okay? And the job of the following abrasive is to lower the peaks and, and, and lower that, that whole uh, setup there. So when you rub your stain or whatever the, the case may be on there, uh, you're not getting, you know, really, still really deep valleys to grab up some of that stain and make a real dark blotchy spot. Now, if you don't do that, if you skip more than one grit in the sand, sanding sequence, let's say you start at 80 grit and you skip directly to 180 grit. What have you just done? You've created large peaks and valleys and then you've gone to such a fine grit that it's not bringing those peaks down. What it's doing is just taking the very tips off those peaks. So you've st still got really deep valleys there. It's gonna gather up a lot of stain. It's gonna be real dark, real blotchy. And one thing else I'd like to add in here is always blow off your workpiece before you move from one grit to the next. Because what happens, let's say you're sanding at 120 grit, Okay, you're finished your 120 grit, you're gonna to move to 150 grit and start your finishing process. If you don't blow off that workpiece, possibly there could have been a 120 grit grain that popped off and is laying on your workpiece. You put that 150 grit sandpaper down there, you have trapped that 120 grit grain in between your 150 grit sandpaper and your workpiece. So what are you doing? You're making swirl marks. And you might not see them until you get to the finish room and you rub some stain on that piece and you go, man, where'd all those swirl marks come from? Always blow off your work piece in between switching sanding grits. Surprise, surprise. Absolutely. <laughs> you love some grain. But we have another question in. I use sandpaper that comes in rolls. Hmm. Which one of your products is best for my application? Rolls, along with all of the different types of uh, coated abrasives we got, we sell it in many different forms. Mm -hmm. Disc, belts, rolls. Um, when we're talking rolls, we go straight to our premium uh, hand roll material, our KL361. It's a J-Flex, as I said, J-Flex on the scale of cloths, on the weighted scale, it is very flexible, mm -hmm. very durable. Um, it is easily, when you take that roll off, you can break off whatever you need. It gets into those nice nooks and crannies, and the applications on it are vast. We've got the wood, Absolutely. the metal, plastics, things like that. It's very, very vast and very, very multi-purpose. That's a good word mm -hmm. for it. Absolutely. But um, with our rolls here at Klingspor, when we sell rolls, we sell rolls in 10 meters, 25 meters, and 50 meters. So that is, uh, you might have to uh, make a decision on how much you need, how much 
you want to use, but if you're doing stuff with a hand, with hand rolls and you need material, our premium hand roll material, KL361, our J-Flex, that's Absolutely. what I would go with. Mm -hmm. So the next question we have is, it's a very broad question, covers a lot of different things, and that's simply what are proper sanding techniques? Mm -hmm. Now, like we talked about application, you have to know all the specifics of what your process is and what you're trying to achieve. But uh, proper sanding techniques, uh, let's say for a random orbital sander. We talked about when you switch grits, blowing off your workpiece, okay? That's part of your proper sanding technique. We talked about uh, never skipping more than one grit in a sanding se sequence. That's proper sanding technique. But also uh, with a random orbital sander, yeah, you use it with one hand, but you can put so much pressure on that thing that you can actually inhibit the uh, process that takes place from this random orbital sander. See, those things are designed to spin, but at the same time, they're thrown off center, kind of jig back and forth. So you never have just one orbit going in one spot. You've got this random, that's why they can't call it a random orbital sander. You've got this random orbit going on, and then you consider that you're moving that thing back and forth too, okay? So what happens if you put too much pressure on that sander is you stop that entire sanding pad from doing, doing its large orbit. You can actually see it. It'll stop. It'll still jig back and forth. It'll still be sanding, but you'll stop that whole pattern the way that that thing was meant to operate. Uh, proper sanding techniques for a belt sander. It, you have to take a lot of things into consideration uh, when you think proper sanding techniques. Of course, we all know as far as pro proper sanding techniques on wood and hand sanding is that you always go with the grain. We got an, uh, the last question in here is a, there somebody out there looking for a recommendation. They say, uh, I want a sandpaper that is universal and can get uh, a lot of different projects done. What would you recommend? My recommendation, our bread and butter here at Klingspore in our disc department, our PS33. Mm -hmm. It is a uh, aluminum oxide. The stair rate on it, like we mentioned before, is built into the resin system. So it won't peel off. It stays there. And it's, um, uh, it's, it's a paperback product. Semi-open coat. Kind of walks the line between that open coat, closed coat. Getting the best of both worlds. But again, wood, metal, the applications are almost endless. Uh, it's something that I use in my own personal workshop. It can get everything done. Um, the, if we, we don't have anything that's 100% universal, but this is the closest thing that we do have. Absolutely. Our PS33. Mm -hmm. And PS33 uh, comes in several different forms. Of course, you yeah. talked about discs. Disc. Uh, we can also do sheets. Uh, we can do several different uh, forms of that nature. We also have it in a plane backing. We have it in uh, what we call our Klingon, uh, our hook and loop backing. And we have it in PSA, pressure sensitive adhesive. In other words, sticky back. That's a term that everybody seems to go by in the industry, sticky back. <laughs> So uh, PS33, now right along with that, and, and Luke met, uh, made mention of it earlier, is our PS and FP77. Uh, that's kind of like a PS33 on steroids, you stop to think about it. Yeah. And uh, the cool thing about the 77 material, or what we call our green tech, is that uh, from uh, 60 grit up to 220 grit, it comes with a paper backing, okay? Mm -hmm. When you hit 320 grit, it starts off with a film backing. If, you, if you've not used the film backings in the past, you might want to try those, especially for durability, for uh, edge retention, stuff oh, like yeah. that. Uh, they're very tough, very durable backing. And that uh, 77 material in the film goes all the way up to 2,000 grit. 2,000. So there's not a whole lot that you uh, can't accomplish with that particular material. Uh, so, you know, we, we've got an entire family of, of abrasives we call the 73 family of, of abrasives. We've got mm -hmm. PS73, we've got uh, VP73, and we've got, uh, there again, film backing, the FP73. And like Luke mentioned earlier, each and every one of them has sterate, okay? So sterate is going to inhibit that loading. So I want to mention to you again, uh, if you're interested in uh, asking us a question, if you've got something you'd like to kind of sort out and, and kick around and, and find out what the answer to the question is, you can send that question to uh, techtalk at clingspore.com. Once again, that's T-E-C-H-T-A-L-K at clingspore.com. Uh, and we'll, uh, if we don't get to it during the live episode that you send it in, 
We will, of course, uh, move, move it down to a further episode, but we will answer your question. We're not going to leave you hanging. We, we just won't do that. So uh, tech talk at clingspore.com. Uh, our next episode will be in two weeks. I believe it's on the 18th when uh, Danny Burnett and Landon Eisenhower will be talking about some uh, subjects about metal. Okay, if you're a metal worker or you've got and you use abrasives, you do grinding, cutting, uh, polishing, sanding, whatever the case may be. These are the two guys that you want to want to have uh, answering your questions. They uh, they definitely know what they're doing and uh, definitely have some experience in the industry and uh, they will help you uh, with any of your questions on uh, metalworking and so on and so forth. So uh, tune in uh, on the 18th of this month in two weeks uh, at, at 3 o'clock and uh, Danny and Landon will be glad to uh, take questions, answer them, uh, and give out some information. And the best part about it is it's all free. Oh yes. It doesn't cost you Absolutely. a thing. This information is all free. Um, great to have you with us today. Uh, Tech talk at clingspore.com. Send those questions in. Uh, we'll be looking for them. We'll be looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, this is about all we have for today. Thank you for joining us for our pilot episode. Good day. <laughs>